So here today I am going to discuss some of the interesting cases on diabetes. Uh, these cases I have seen over the last say uh, one decades and they have come to me with some interesting issues related to diabetes. Now especially I have picked up those cases which are associated with some kind of syndromes. So most of the cases which I will discuss will have diabetes along with some kind of syndromes. Some of these cases are quite common, but many of them are not very common. But we have to sensitize ourselves about these cases because sometimes we do see in our clinical practice some of the uncommon situations or uncommon cause of diabetes. And therefore, we have to be aware about these issues because their pathophysiology is a little bit different and, and also sometimes their, their uh, management also differs uh, quite distinctly from that of the conventional type 2 diabetes mortis. So with this, let me, in, let me start with my first case, a 15-year-old girl who came to me for the weight gain because she was quite heavy and she had some dirt discoloration in the neck region. You can see the weight was 74 at the age of 15 with the height of 150, 74 was quite, uh, quite an heavy amount. And waist circumference was also uh, quite big. And a uh, patient has got uh, uh, acanthosis nigricans in different parts of the body, especially on the neck. Oh, uh, maybe sir has posed. Uh, just a minute, I am calling this sir. Sir, you are visible now. Yeah, there was some. Is the slide showing? Yes, yes, sir. Your slide is visible. Okay. So now, if we look into the lipid profile of this patient, we find that the triglyceride level was quite high. And also the, the HDL level was low, indicating that the patient also have diabetic dyslipidemia. So this kind of patient can come to you with obesity, with acanthesis nigricans, indicating a significant insulin resistance and also with diabetic dyslipidemia. And nowadays we see a lot of young children have the obesity and many of them actually suffers from type 2 diabetes mellitus. So this patient basically had type 2 diabetes mellitus and therefore we also have to check whether this patient qualifies for the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome or not. We have a little bit a different criteria for the metabolic syndrome among the South Asian population. And first, we have to look into these into the waist circumference. And the cutoff value for the waist circumference is 80. Now, this patient has a waist circumference much above the 80 centimeter. And the patient also had the triglyceride level of uh, more than 150 and HDL level less than 50. 
the blood pressure was normal but the patient had a fasting plasma glucose more than 110 and therefore this patient actually uh, actually had insulin resistance syndrome or you can say in other words the metabolic syndrome so now i can i can show you another case of cortinier is a boy almost similar with presented with a massive gain in the weight non diabetic non hypertensive but the father is diabetic for a long time and his body weight was 113 kg a right? huge and with a waist circumference of 142 cm if we look into the uh, the uh, lab reports the patient was not diabetic but uh, but his uh, cholesterol level shows that he has very high level of the triglyceride with low level of the hdl therefore he also qualifies for the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome now this patient did not require any anti-diabetic drug because he is not yet diabetic but this patient requires a lifestyle modification as far as the management is concerned now this patient a 32 years female diabetic for the last four years came with with a history of weakness difficulty in swallowing difficulty in opening the mouth tight skin dry mouth and exertional dyspnea now she had a very tight skin on her face on hands on neck and other parts and was unable to open her hands because of the sclerosis and fundus was normal just looking into the patient most of you actually will be able to diagnose this patient this patient actually had scleroderma and she was admitted in the hospital with this problem now we can see at the time of presentation in the hospital, her glycemic control was very poor. Lipid profile was normal, but she had subclinical hypothyroidism. As you can see, the TSH value is 8.3. anti tipo antibody was positive, and she she has got a other and markers of uh, scleroderma was also positive. Antinuclear antibody and SCL70 antibody, and therefore this patient actually have diabetes in scleroderma. With scleroderma. Now the question is, as scleroderma, you know, is a basically an autoimmune disease. So the question is whether patients who have scleroderma and this kind of disease, whether they have an increased prevalence of diabetes or not, especially the type one diabetes. Now I can I can show you one very important published paper. It was a it was basically a nationwide report study from the from the Taiwan, and they say that the the among the patient with of scleroderma, the possibility of type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes is quite low. So therefore, this association of this patient is something rare and we do not expect that the our scleroderma patient will have higher possibility of type 1 and type 2 diabetes, rather they have reduced incidence of type 1 and diabetes, type 1 and type 2 diabetes in the system of sclerosis. Now, this is a 42-year-old male diagnosed three years ago with type 2 diabetes mortal with A1C 10.6 at the time of diagnosis. And he was receiving glimepiride and metformin and gradually updated at the dose so that now he is receiving glimepiride 6 mg and metformin 2 gram. So he does not use uh, tobacco, alcohol, he never had any pancreatitis, no family history of diabetes. Elder sister has thyroid problem and receiving thyroxine, probably suffering from autoimmune thyroid disease. And he was not overweight, you can see, which we commonly traditionally see in most of our type 2 diabetic subjects. And he was quite lean with BMI 23. And if you look into the glycemic control, age was is 8.7. But very interestingly, the patient has got a very normal lipid profile and the patient does not have the typical dyslipidemia, we see our uh, type 2 diabetes, type 2 diabetic subject that is high TG and low HDL. It was not there. The patient has got a normal TG and normal HDL. So therefore, some odd points of is was there as far as the diabetes of this patient is concerned. And the, the patient has got a normal body weight and there is no evidence of insulin resistance. He was quite active. There is no family history of diabetes. He was initially controlled with oral anti-diabetic drug, but very quickly, within three years period of time, the glycemic control has gone to more than 10%, and his elder sister has a thyroid disorder, possibly of autoimmune disease. And you can see, we have checked the C-peptide level, which is quite low, and anti-GAD antibody was positive, 
So it indicates that possibly the patient has got some continuum background. Now, any patient who is lean, especially I'm talking about any patient who is lean, and if you find that this patient do not have any insulin resistance marker, and they uh, possibly doesn't look like type 2 diabetes mellitus, we have to think some other possibility among this group of subjects. Now, this is the absence of diabetic dyslipidemia, positive autoantibodies, insufficient insulin production. We don't expect this amount of low CP pride level among our type 2 diabetic subjects and families to have autoimmune disease. So all these important points, which is distinctly different from that of the traditional type 2 diabetes mellitus, indicates that possibly we are dealing with the adult onset type type 1 diabetes or we conventionally call LADA or late onset autoimmune diabetes in adult. Now, when we, it is important because of the fact that the, you know, type 1 diabetes is quite common in our country and India has got a largest number of type 1 diabetes um, in the world. And therefore, we also have a huge number of late onset autoimmune diabetes and many of these patients are actually uh, wrongly diagnosed as type 2 diabetes and was basically not treated properly because unless and until you give insulin, many of them will not respond properly and therefore the glycemic control remains, uh, un un uh, remains very high. Now to differentiate between the three, the type 1, type 2 and LADA, you can take this is the chart with which you can see, uh, but as I've already told you, that it, it should look different. Now they uh, don't come to the A uh, uh, don't come at the age of 15, which traditionally we see our type 1 diabetes around the age of 10 to 15. It traditionally see our type 2 diabetes above the age of 30 or 40. So these patients will come above, above the age of 30 years, but the issue is they are lean. They do not have any insulin resistance markers and they usually require insulin, uh, insulin within a very short sp span of time. And you can get some uh, autoantibody markers, especially the GAD antibody among the larger subjects. And, and if we look into the C-peptide level, the C-peptide level in the larder is very low. It is almost uh, almost to the level of type 1 diabetic subjects, or it may be between type 1 and type 2 diabetic subjects. So they may appear to have type 2 diabetes phenotypically, but do not have an early requirement for insulin as in type 1, but they progressively uh, progressively require insulin within a short span of time, may, say for example, one year or two years. They are positive autoantibodies and they have greater preservation of beta cell function with slower development of absolute insulin deficiency. That is the pathophysiology of the defect, but invariably developed to, uh, for, for need of an insulin. Now, diagnostic criteria is adult age at the diagnosis, more than 30, positive or at least one antibody uh, usually seen in type 1 should be present, and evidence of at least temporary preservation of beta cell. It means at least the patient was controlled with oral anti-diabetic drug for the initial six months of, of, of the detection of the diabetes. Now, how you treat this patient? Therapeutic lifestyle, that is the first. Metformin. Uh, usually, uh, these patients do not have insulin resistance and therefore we, you can get, but the response to the metformin therapy is very short. Insulin is a mainstay of therapy, so we have to treat the patient with basal bolus regime. Patient, we should educate the patient about the insulin administration, titration, curve counting. Now, whether we, we can treat this patient with DP4 inhibitor, GLP-1 receptor agonist, thiazolidin then, or SGLP inhibitor is not known because there is no, no good evidence to support the use of all these agents in, in, the, in LADA. And just to remember, very important point that it is better not to treat the patient with sulfonuria because if you treat the patient with sulfonuria, very quickly the patient will require the insulin therapy because it will exhaust the beta cell function. Now, this is another patient, a 15-year-old female presented in the in our hospital with recent detection of high blood sugar in December 2015. The past medical history was unremarkable. Her mother and maternal grandmother was diabetic and her body mass index was uh, 28. Rest of the examination was unremarkable. And if you look into the profile of this patient, the patient presented with a very high because with age 1 c of 11.4 
and as because she was quite young, so we actually checked uh, for the C peptide level, anti CAD antibody, anti IA antibody, all these were negative, and C peptide was more than 0.6, therefore, indicate that she had adequate uh, beta cell reserve. So we have started the insulin at the very beginning with the 287 and 417 was uh, was basically the blood glycemic level at the time of presentation. So we started the insulin. Later, once she is controlled, we shift the patient to glimepiride and metformin twice daily. But after the patient was shifted to oral medication, she was lost in the follow-up. I have I had seen this patient in the in our intensive care unit after two years. And in the emergency room, she had an altered mental status, fever, vomiting with very poor glycemic status. The medication she stopped for the last six months. There was signs of volume depletion and, and H1C was 13.7. She was positive for dengue NS1 antigen. The, you can see the arterial pH 7.157 indicating a severe degree of uh, acidosis and there was a positive ketone in the urine. So we were actually dealing with diabetic ketoacidosis and the patient was treated with IV insulin and the IV fluids and she recovered uneventfully and was discharged on a basal, basal bolus regime. Now, if we come back to the patient and see in the back in this patient about the first presentation and the second presentation, you can see it is a 17-year-old old, old obese girl. She had positive family history of diabetes, no evidence of beta cell autoimmunity because anti antibodies were negative at the time of presentation. Signs of insulin resistance was there. She was initially managed with oral anti-diabetic agent. We are not expecting the decay out of this this patient because our diagnosis was tied to diabetes because she had a strong family history she was quite abs and therefore uh, therefore but the patient presented with dk which is quite uh, un unlikely among the subjects with type 2 diabetes mellitus so we checked the beta cell function of this patient up, uh, after recovery from the dk and we find that the c peptide level was very low 0.6 less than 0.6 nanogram per ml but at the time of presentation, her C peptide level was very, oh, it was quite good. Beta cell result was quite good. Now, what happened? And she had, had a significant reduction in the in the beta cell function, and suddenly became uh, suddenly she developed decay for which she was admitted in the hospital. So this kind of diabetes is known as actually flat push diabetes. Is not typically of type one diabetes, not typically of type two diabetes as, as well. Now they. It was first actually demonstrated in in USA uh, from the African from the African descent. They were now reported among the Indians and other Asian Asian population as well. <coughs> Presents with sudden onset of extremely high blood glucose level and sometimes with decay they can present. They have absent antibody against the beta cell, so though uh, so they don't behave like type one diabetes, but they are. Or their antibody titer was not like type 1 diabetes, they're often overweight, have relatives with type 2 diabetes, melters with insulin resistance, often respond to oral anti diabetic drug for months or even years. Relapse of another episode of decay is quite common, and after 10 years, over 60% of these patients do need insulin for the good control, but this is close to the percentage of the people with type 2 diabetes, melters. It means that these patients actually come like type 2 diabetes, melters. But because of whatever may be the reason, they suddenly become decay. And most of the time, people thought that possibly it, it occurs because of the glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity, which often precipitated by the viral infection, heart disease infection. Here in this case, we have found the dengue fever. So after the dengue patient has a precipitation of decay, and this patient actually had a flat push diabetes. So with so if you look into the different types of ketosis prone diabetes, we know type 1 diabetes are very much ketosis prone. So this is type 1A and type 1B, they are ketosis prone. As we have already discussed with the LADA, the LADA patients are also late onset type 1 diabetes. They are also uh, uh, ketosis prone. And now I have discussed with you regarding the flat push diabetes. They are also basically ketosis prone. Now, this is a young boy of 10 years who came uh, in 2008 with obesity, undescended testes, hyperactivity, and mental retardation. He was the second of the two siblings and born to non consanguineous parents, mother, 
was found to, to be diabetic at seven months of pregnancy and took insulin. He was born on cesarean section. Birth weight was not very high, 2.1. He had knock knees, detected at the time of walking at two years. He had an episode of seizure at two and a half years of age. He had increased appetite, temper tantrums from early childhood. He was very, very, uh, you know, restless child. And uh, his vision and hearing was normal. And he and he used to eat a lot when he came to me. That that was a very very important complaint of the parents that the, he eats a lot. And you can see that this patient was quite heavy with a 49 kg body weight uh, at that age with 120 centimeter height. He was quite obese with some stria marks and narrowing of the temporal region on both sides with blue iris, upslanting eye, lipomastia, stria over abdomen, and he had bilateral undescended testes and the phallus was four centimeter. So as because he had a trauma, so we actually looked into uh, the cortisol levels. So this is the initial preliminary investigation we, we have done. They, everything was normal, including the thyroid function report. And then we actually uh, looked into the cortisol level, which was quite high. And therefore we have done an overnight dexamethasone suppression which goes to less than 1.10. So this indicates that the, he is not suffering from Cushing's disease, but uh, but you can see that the, this patient has got no testicular tissue in the bilateral inguinal region. And then we have done an MRI to detect the local, to localize the testes, which also failed. And therefore, the pediatric surgeon has uh, refused to get him operated for the detection of the testes and to bring the testes down to the scrota. So he was not operated. So we had a strong suspicion because of, of his weight, because of his appetite and because of his behavior. So we have asked for a karyotype and it came from a microdeletion of chromosome 15 and the diagnosis was prader willi syndrome. Now this patient uh, was on my follow-up and came to October 2011 at the age of 13 years when he developed diabetes, he had further gain in the weight by 24 kg. And if you look into the profile of this patient, his glycemic control was very poor with age was in 9.9 at the time of detection of the diabetes and cholesterol level has gone up to 240. The other function was normal. So we started the oral anti-diabetic medication and then we started insulin in 2013 when the patient cannot be controlled with oral anti-diabetic agents. Now, if we look into different syndromes which actually come with diabetes in, in, church, in childhood, we will find that the prader will is one of them. prader will patient often develops diabetes and most of the time the diabetes is basically a type 2 diabetes. Predator sedaxia can also can develop diabetes, clean filter syndrome and then down turner. These are quite common uh, syndromes which can, uh, which are we, we see in our clinical practice and all of them actually can present with diabetes not always but sometimes they can present with the diabetes virus. now this is a 28 years male admitted in the in our hospital with weakness uncontrolled hyperglycemia he had no history of alcohol or hepatobiliary disease he had recurrent pain up to a large volume stool and the and the glucose control was very poor, 321 pH. As you can see, this patient admitted in our hospital he, uh, and he was quite malnourished. So, in a, a malnourished patient with a pain abdomen, with large volume stool and diabetes, we have a, we have a strong suspicion about the diagnosis. And you can see we have done an, an X-ray and you can see there is a significant amount of pancreatic calcification which was there, which across the, uh, the, the, the spine. And, and uh, this is the pancreatic calcification. The nutrition was poor and, and the patient had an absence of buccal fat. And therefore the diagnosis quite clear that we are dealing with a fibrocalculus pancreatic diabetes. This is very important to identify the fibrocalculus pancreatic diabetes because these patients will not respond to oral antidiabetic agent and they will require insulin. And usually the dose of insulin is much higher compared to our type one diabetes. Now, this is the clinical spectrum as published from India that usually they present above the age of eight, uh, about the age of 20 years. 
their BMI is always low and they usually require insulin as I've already told you at the time of presentation H1C remains very high and C peptide level may be from very low to normal and to to pathognomonic complaint is the pancreatic pain steatoria is present in most of the patient but not always and very interesting point to remember that they usually don't suffer from diabetic ketoacidosis despite the fact if you stop the insulin therapy for a long period of time. Now this is another 11 year old boy who presented with mild hyperplastia and there was two reports with him that is fasting 131 and another one 129. His father and one paternal uncle diabetic since very young age. Now uh, no grandparents history was available. He was quite lean. We checked the autoantibody, it was negative. He was not insulin resistant, so no immediate treatment was done. He was asked to come back after three months of a three months period, but he was lost in follow up. Came back to after two years with his young younger sister who also developed diabetes, and her uh, her gl glucose was also the, of the similar similar range, say fasting 130 and and the PP maybe 150 or 56 something like that. Both were asymptomatic. Both had only mild hyperglycemia, but the patient has got a very significant family history of early onset type 2 diabetes. So we have started the lifestyle modification, remained well without medication, and age one c was 6.5. So mostly we are, possibly we are dealing with a MODI. And if you can see the criteria for the MODI is the atypical diabetes and multiple family members are affected. They are not typical of type 1 or type 2, you can see at 11 years of age, if the patient comes with a type 1 diabetes, if we don't treat the patient, the patient will definitely develop a lot of complications, including severe hyperglycemia and ketosis, which was not there. The, the glycemic control, the glycemic profile was not progressive, just like we see in type 2 diabetes mellitus. The patient was quite, uh, quite, uh, quite thin. And now this patient also have it, uh, we can check into the biomarker, the C peptide by creatinine ratio. Usually we don't find the autoantibodies, but we can check the molecular genetic diagnostic test, which is available in India. You can do it, but the issue is it, it costs a lot, so majority of our patient can't afford. So this is basically the pedigree chart. This is the this is our index patient. This is his uh, younger sister, and this is the the, the father and the uncle, we don't know, we do not know about the maternal side and we do not know the, the, the uh, grandparents about the history of diabetes. There are a lot of variety of MODI from 1 to 11 and there may be few more maybe may come in future, but we find that the 2, 3 MODI is quite common. One is the defect in the glucokinase gene, another is the Effect in the hepatocyte nuclear factor, that is MODI 1, MODI 2, MODI 3, and MODI 5, they are uh, common among the MODI group. Now, this is a 62 year male diabetic, six years and hypertensive for the last five years, now admitted in the hospital with uncontrolled hyperglycemia. He last visited the doctor seven months back. The glycemic control was very poor and the blood pressure was 160 by 90. He had a deep voice, large and abdominal and abnormal face. And you can see just by looking into this patient, you should make a diagnosis. And we have actually done a basal growth hormone. It was 20. After 75 gram glucose, there was no suppression. MRI scan shows pituitary macro abnormal, and the diagnosis is acromegaly. So this is also one kind of syndromes which we, we see. And those patients and uh, these patients actually can present with diabetes. He came for diabetes. He didn't say that I have acromegaly. No acromegaly patient will come to you with the diagnosis and will tell you that I have acromegaly. So this patient present present with us with, with, with diabetes. Now, this is my last case. Now, this is a 34 year old female who, who came to me in 2007. She had a very bad past history. In 1972, she was born with a full term normal delivery and her scholastic performance was average. In 1981, at the age of nine years, she had a gradual weight loss when she was first time detected as type 1 diabetes. In 1985, she developed the visual impairment, so cataract was detected and it was operated. Vision improved, but not normal, so the, the, again the evaluation was done, was found to have optic atrophy, mild of degree optic atrophy bilateral. And in 1986, he, she started 
develop uh, they started developing the, the hearing problem and it was suggested as a retrocochlear deafness and in 2001 in at 29 years of age possibly she had a cardiovascular accident and there was a right sided hemiplegia and she became wheelchair bound so when she came to me she was actually wheelchair bound when in 2007 now what are the points you can see that this patient had a type 1 diabetes she had an early cattle she had optic atrophy she had a retrocochlear deafness she had no diabetes in insipidus and as a severe so when you see this constellation of this picture uh, then we have to think about two important differential diagnoses. One is maternally inherited diabetes and deafness, MIDD, or did what we call it, diabetes insipidus, diabetes mellitus, optic atrophy, and deafness, or this is also called as a Wolfram syndrome. Now, if we look, we, we have evaluated the patient a little bit to look into what about the eyes. So it was found that the, she had a reduced visual evoke potential on the both sides. The MRI scan was already there with her, done in 2001. You can see multiple hyperintense area in the deep white matter. So there was significant involved neurological involvement and the glycemic control was not very bad, but it was done with 115 units of insulin. Uh, so if we look, compare between, I don't know that whether we are really dealing with the deep mode or MIDD because we could not do the genetic test, which we should do to get the diagnosis done, whether it is deep mode or it is MIDDD. But, uh, but the issue is that if we compare our, our patient with that of the uh, deep mode and the maternally inherited tab, as you can see, that they, she actually uh, goes more in favor of the deep mode syndrome. But the issue is this patient do not have diabetes insipidus. So the classically deep mode syndrome patient have diabetes insipidus as well. But uh, though it is present maybe only of 40% cases, so this patient did not have diabetes in spital. But neurological problem is present in both. This patient actually, uh, the maternally inherited diabetes actually have maculopathy, not optic atrophy. So presence of optic atrophy, presence of sensory neural deafness, uh, and, and the neurological symptoms, and onset of diabetes at the age of nine years, possibly we are dealing with a deep mode syndrome even though the patient do not have diabetes mellitus. So uh, the take home message is that the all asymptomatic Indian obese children should be tested for type 2 diabetes mellitus, especially if the family history of is positive. So that we should do very carefully because the patient may come to us with, with obesity, but we should test for the diabetes mellitus. So most of the children actually have either type 1 or type 2 or MODI. But as I have shown you that there are many other varieties of diabetes may be possible. If you find that they are not classically uh, classically matching with that of type 1 or type 2, you have to think out of the box and you have to find out that what may be the possible possible etiology of the diabetes because sometimes the treatment, treatment and the approach to the problem may uh, vary. Distinguishing between different varieties among children and adults present a diagnostic challenges, not always, but sometimes there, as I have shown you many cases, there are a lot of challenges as far as the diagnosis is concerned. But as all of you know, the most of the patient actually have type 1 or type 2, so there is not much challenge. But these are the cases which were basically quite challenging. Some rare genetic syndrome may be associated with diabetes, as I have already shown you one or two but you may get some other rare genetic syndrome and these patients can develop diabetes also. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Over to